Okay. This is the final installment of the Wednesday night um, men's class at First Baptist Church, at least for this, um, this go around. We've been studying the Gospel of John, and we finally made it to John chapter 4 after so many weeks. And last week, we were studying this beginning part of John chapter 4, where Jesus spends some time in a conversation alone with a woman of Samaria at the well. And uh, we're going to continue and finish that story tonight. And so I would like for us to um, pick up reading where we left off. And then after that, I'm going to do a little bit of a review of what we talked about last week. And then we'll get into um, the continuation here. So we've got, uh, we're going to be reading... John chapter 4, verses 27 through 42. Um, that's not all the way to the next subheading in my Bible, but that's really where this story ends is in 42. So, David, um, let's you and me just split that up. How about if you will read for us verses 27 through 30, and then I'll read uh, the middle paragraph there, verses 31 through 38, and then if you'll finish for us verses 39 through 42. Does that work? Okay. All right, you go ahead and start. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking to the woman. But no one asked, What do you want or why are you talking to her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town. He said to the people, Come to a man who told me everything I ever did. Would be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. All right, in verse 31, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. David, if you'll finish up there, verses 39 through 42. Any of the Samaritans of that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did, but when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with him. He stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what he said. Now we have heard for ourselves. You know, this man really is the savior of the world. Very good. So let's do a little bit of a review. Um, I'm going to draw our our map that we've been going through the last several weeks. We were we started out here's the Sea of Galilee, and the Jordan River comes south out of that. Uh, we were baptizing with John the Baptist at Bethany, and then Jesus and his disciples traveled up into Galilee to Cana. That's where the first sign was performed. That's the turning water into wine. Then eventually they made their way down here to Jerusalem for the Passover feast, and that's where he had the conversation with Nicodemus, where that John 3.16 verse that's so popular and well-known, that happened there in Jerusalem. So then he decides to leave Jerusalem and the surrounding countryside of Judea and go back to Galilee. But to get there, he's got to go through Samaria, and Samaria is right here in the middle. And if we remember from last week, Samaria is inhabited by who we call the Samaritans. Uh, the Samaritans were those who were left behind in the last great exile of the Israelite nation. Um, the enemy nations came and captured the Israelites and took them back to their native land, but they left some behind in Samaria. And over time, over the 70-year period of exile, the Samaritans 
began to intermingle and intermarry with the surrounding nations of their country, and their practices, their worship of false gods, came into the religious practices of the Samaritans. And for this reason, the Jews hated the Samaritans' guts. I mean, they really did not get along. They didn't speak. They didn't do business with each other. They didn't walk down the same side of the road together. And so generally, if a Jew was passing, uh, going from Judea to Galilee, if they had time, they would go the long way around. They would go over here by the Jordan, or they would go on the west hand side. But there is a road that goes right up through the center. Let me get my eraser out here for just a sec, because our story takes place right there in the middle in a town called Sychar. And just outside Sychar is a mountain, Mount Gerizim. I'm going to put Mount G because it's hard to spell. Mount Gerizim is where the Samaritans worshipped. There was a temple on that mountain. It was very similar to the temple in Jerusalem, and the worship practices there were very similar as well. And so the biggest theological disagreement between the Jews and the Samaritans was over where do you worship, here on this mountain or in Jerusalem? And that played into our story last week. Jesus goes to meet the woman at the well, and I, I drew the, a picture of this well last time. There's a big stone over the top of it. It's not like that, you know, wishing well like we sometimes see in gardens and things. But there's a stone over the top of it with a little hole here, and it goes into a lower chamber, and that's where the big hole that was the actual well was. And this, I read one account that said it was 30 yards deep. That's 90 feet. And the last, the water was only down here in the last five feet. You'd have a really long rope with a bucket to get water out of this thing. And this well is not even close to town. It's out in the field. So Jesus sends the disciples into town to get water, and he sits down here uh, next to the well. And lo and behold, the whole reason why he came out here to this well walks up, and that's this Samaritan woman. And she's got her a bucket and some rope, and she is there to get water. But if we remember, she's there at the sixth hour. She's there at noon in the hottest part of the day, which is not when women went to get water out of the well. She's there alone, not with her friends. This normally is a social activity. She's doing quite the opposite. The reason for that is revealed to us as Jesus begins to have a conversation with her and talk with her about spiritual things. He uses the context of gathering water from the well to turn to talking about living water, living water, and he says that that living water would well up in a man yielding eternal life, and now he's full-on talking about spiritual things, and she still hasn't gotten over that hump. He wants to get to the gospel part of this conversation and tell her about the Messiah straight up, but he's got to get her to understand first the sin in her life. So he asks her about her husband, and she says, well, I have no husband. And he says, yeah, that's right. You've had five husbands. Here's five husbands. Um, I'm, I'm going to draw them all standing here next to each other. They're not really holding hands. And the one that you're living with now is not your husband. And so it's revealed to us here that he had, A, he had intimate supernatural knowledge of her past and what she had done, what the sin was in her life. And he called her straight out on it. She had been uh, likely unfaithful to her husbands. So many, I mean, this is, we would say this is a girl that likes to get around some, okay? She's been sleeping around. And the man she's living with now is not even her husband. So she's shacked up with another guy and she's living in that sin. And he calls her out on it. And her reaction is to go, now, wait a minute. I don't want to talk about that, right? We could talk about a lot of things, but I don't want to talk about my sin. She says, so let's, you know, I, I could tell you're a prophet because otherwise, how would you have known that about me? So let's talk about this deep debate between Jews and Samaritans. That's what we drew over here on the map. Where do we worship? She says, my father's worship on this mountain. You say we should worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus pulls the whole rug out from under that argument. He says, he says, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, ultimately, will you worship the father. God is spirit, and he seeks those who would worship him to do so in spirit and truth. And she can see she's outclassed by Jesus in this debate. So she pulls out a trump card, a get-out-of-jail-free card, so to speak, and says, well, I know that the Messiah will come, the one who is called Christ, and he will tell us all things. In other words, you and I may disagree on this, 
But when that guy comes, the one that we call the Messiah, he's going to settle this once and for all. So we can just agree to disagree until then. And he blows her mind with the statement we finished on last week. And I'll write it up here on the board. He says, David, can you reread that for us? Chapter 4, verse 26. What does Jesus say to her? That Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. I who speak to you am he. Now, she's, this is in reference, when he says am he, this is in reference to what she said when the Messiah comes. He literally now, in his own words, has called himself the Messiah. This is the first time in the whole Gospel of John that he's done that. Now, he's called himself the Son of Man. He's called, um, uh, others have called him the Savior of the world. Uh, they've called him the Son of God. Um, here in chapter 1, John the Baptist calls him the Lamb of God. He's called the Eternal Logos. But Jesus has not come out, and even when he turned the water into wine, he didn't say this. He, he comes out and says, I am the Messiah. Now, let's think about that for a second. Because who, who's in this picture? If we're looking at this through the camera, like we're watching a TV show, who's in the frame? Who's there at the well? Well, we've got Jesus, and he's sitting on the ground by the well, and we've got this woman, a social outcast in the village of Sychar. She doesn't even want to go to the well when there's other women there because they'll make fun of her. They'll tell her, you can't sit with us. You know, you're, you're, a, you're, a, um, you're a not nice girl. Well, he's now revealed the deepest truth about his identity, who he is and what his mission is, to one woman who is alone and she's not prominent. In fact, she's not even like a super righteous person. He doesn't say this to the Pharisees. He doesn't even say this to his disciples. Remember, he sent them away to go and get food. And that's where we pick up. He's just made this earth-shattering declaration to her. He's proved it already by telling her things about her life that he could not have known unless it was supernatural. Um, and then he says, I who speak to you am he. Now, that's where we pick up. So continue reading with me in verse 27. It says, just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the disciples have gone off, and I'll, I'll draw them here. They come walking up. And they've got food in their hands. Here's a basket full of food. And they've got drinks. Um, I don't know how to draw that. You know, big, you know, things of uh, uh, goat skins full of water and stuff like that. And they walk up, and here's Jesus talking alone with a woman. And they're a little surprised. Well, for one, men in that day and age did not speak to women in public especially if they were alone. Now, this was to give a semblance of propriety when, and in matter of fact, they weren't any more proper in their relations with women they weren't married to than we are today. That it was very common, you know, those days to, to have the same kind of things going on as we do today. But at least in public, they made this, uh, this almost very strict outward display. And that persists today in Middle Eastern regions that men and women don't speak together in public unless they've got very good reason to, and they definitely don't do it when they're alone. So there's that issue. That holds doubly true for rabbis, okay? These were the spiritual leaders in the community. They would have made for absolute sure nobody gets the wrong impression about what's going on between the two of them. And the third reason is that Jesus is a Jew, and she's very clearly a Samaritan. And that's an excellent reason in their minds why they definitely shouldn't be talking, because as it was said earlier in John chapter 4, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. But do they say anything about it? They don't. 
they don't tell her, what do you seek? In other words, they don't go up to her and say, um, I'm sorry, can we help you? Because you're, this is not how this is supposed to work. You know, you need to leave our master alone. They've done that in other places in scripture. They don't do that here. And they also don't say, why are you talking with her? And I kind of feel like they would sort of sidle up next to Jesus and, and get his attention and go, hey, why, dude, why are you talking with her? This can, can we make this go away for you? Because maybe she's walked up to you and engaged you in conversation. You're just trying to be polite. But none of that is the case. And they don't question him. They actually wait until she leaves. Now, she does leave. It says she left in verse 28. So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And so in her excitement, she now runs away. And I'm going to redraw my picture over here. Here's the well, and it goes down like this. And here's Jesus by the well. And his disciples now come up to him and are talking with him. And she leaves the bucket. I'm just going to draw it on the ground right here. She leaves her vessel, and she makes haste to go back to town. And I'm going to draw it way out here in the distance. Um, here's the town with some walls and buildings, and she's running off to go tell her friends, and she leaves the disciples behind. And our story is sort of, um, from a time perspective, the next paragraph after this happens while she's going off and telling her friends and inviting them to come, and then you can kind of see them coming in the distance. So time-wise, I kind of want us to, to see that in our heads. She's having a conversation with them, and at the same time, the disciples are having a conversation with Jesus. So we'll start with what she talks, just because it's presented this way. We'll start with what she says to her friends. She leaves her water jar and goes into town and says, this, this is the, the watchword, really, for these first few chapters of John. She says, come and see. Now, um, if you remember several weeks ago when we were in John chapter 1. We saw that phrase, come and see, play out twice. So let's reread that a little. Keep a finger in John chapter 4 and flip with me back to John chapter 1. And David, can you reread for me um, some of these passages in John chapter 1? Sure. So let's look first at John chapter 1 verse... Um, Verses 35 through 39. We'll start with that one. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. He saw Jesus passing by and said, Look, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this and followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them fall. He said, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? Come, he replied, and we will see. So they went to Paul, where he was staying, and took him that day with him. He was about to step out. Very good. So this, this passage in John chapter 1 is where John the Baptist uh, has standing, is standing with two of his disciples, and he's doing what he was called to do. Jesus comes walking by, and he points to Christ. That's what he did throughout his whole ministry. He pointed to Christ. He was the forerunner, and he understood his relationship, just as we studied two weeks ago. He understood very well his relationship to Christ. His job was not to be first and foremost. It was to point the way to Christ. He points and says, Behold the Lamb of God. And those two disciples hear him say this and say, Oh, he wants us to follow Jesus. Well, let's go do that. So they go follow Jesus, and they ask him, Where are you staying? To ask him, Basically, we want to spend some time with you. We want to know what you're about. We want to learn from you and study from you. And he says to them, come and you will see. So they came and they saw. And in that verse, that phrase gets repeated again just a couple paragraphs later when um, Philip goes to tell Nathaniel, his friend, about the man, Jesus, that he had just met. So I'll read this part. You'll follow along. I'm in John chapter 1, uh, verse 45. So John chapter 1 and verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, 
We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. So, and, and then they, they come towards Jesus, and Jesus sees Nathanael and sees his true heart and, and calls him out for it. And, and ultimately, Nathanael believes. But I wanted to point this out that, you know, when, when we make uh, an invitation to somebody to tell them about Christ, to say, hey, you should come to church with me. Hey, you should read the Bible with me. Hey, can I tell you about Jesus? And they're skeptical. They're not sure. Um, this, this should be right there on the tip of our tongues. Come and see. And that's what the Samaritan woman does. Flip with me back to John chapter 4. She goes into the town, and we got to remember who she is, okay? This is a social outcast. Now, that does not mean that she doesn't have friends. It, you know, Jesus was accused of hanging out and fraternizing with uh, prostitutes and tax collectors, all right? Well, they all had friends. And so Jesus here has gone intentionally to talk to this woman, and she goes and meets her friends, and they probably run in the same crowd she does. And I guarantee you some of them were a little unsure. Now, it says later on that many of them believed just because of her testimony. But others didn't believe until they came and saw Jesus. And so we can give our testimony, and we've got to understand that the power of the gospel is not in our description of our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That can be an opportunity for us to explain the gospel, but ultimately the words of this book are what have the power to save. And so we may give somebody a testimony and they go, you know, I understand that you had a personal experience, but I'm just not sure. And we should say, tell you what, come and see, come with me, test it out and see for yourself. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And we see that this is what happens. In verse 39, many, of, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. And, so, and then they followed her back to Jesus. Now, the other part that I want to point out here, in verse 29, she says, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. All that I ever did. Well, the only thing he's told her so far is that she's had five husbands, which is a small part of her life. Um, so we've got two options here. Either A, she's doing like my wife and she's just exaggerating, or they had a longer conversation than what's recorded here, which is very probable. You know, a, a lot of times conversations here in scripture, uh, we get the highlights, we get the, the main doctrinal meat here and it, and it flows, but it's not unlikely that there was some conversation that's just not recorded here. They may have had a longer conversation where she goes, wait, you're the Messiah? And then they just started to talk about things. And, she, and he began to explain things about her that she didn't think anybody knew. Now, why is that a big deal? Well, there's a, the big deal part of that is that this is the proof in the pudding, so to speak, that Jesus really is the Messiah. I'd like for us to turn to the book of Isaiah to see of an example of why the Jews would have been looking for a man who could see inside your heart and know who you really were without looking at your outside or listening to your words um, or hearing what you had to say. So keep a finger in John chapter 4. I'm going to stick my bookmark in here and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11. If you split your Bible right down the middle, you'll probably land in Psalms or Proverbs, and you just turn a couple of books to the right, a couple couple, three books to the right, and you'll be in Isaiah. Isaiah is one of the major prophets in the Old Testament, and that just means he wrote a really big book in the Old Testament. The minor prophets just have shorter books. So we're in Isaiah chapter 11, and this is a prophecy about the Messiah. Well, that's who Jesus is. And the, the Jews recognized this as me, uh, messianic prophecy, that this was a prophecy about the Messiah to come. One thing to note here in verse 1, it says, um, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Well, that Jesse that it's referring to is the father of David. This is David who slew Goliath and ultimately became King David. And David was promised by God that one of his descendants would sit on the throne uh, of Israel forever. 
that ultimately is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, who is a descendant of David. So this is talking about Jesus. I want to point that out real quick before we read this portion. Um, David, can you, you David, not David, this David, you David, can you read for us chapter 11 in Isaiah verses 1 through 5? Shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from the seed, the grain will be a few. Fear of the Lord will rest, rest on you. Spirit of wisdom and understanding, spirit of counsel and of power, spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees in the time, by very good hey dad i see you joining us all right, so we're, uh, we're, Dad, we're in Isaiah chapter 11 at the moment. So what I want to sort of zone in on here is Isaiah chapter 11, um, the last part of, I guess, verses 2 and 3. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His uh, delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear. Now, the Jews studying these scriptures understood that to mean that Jesus, when he saw a man, could see who he really was on the inside. We saw examples of that. If you'll flip back with me to John um, chapters 1 and 2, we saw examples of that when, yeah, chapter 1, when Andrew brings Simon Peter to see Jesus, and Jesus sees him and says, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be, you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Uh, that means rock. He didn't just see who he was. He saw who he was going to become. This was a supernatural insight there into who uh, Peter was. He does the same thing with Nathaniel. Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. He knows of this man's integrity when he walked up. He didn't even have to tell him or have somebody else tell him about it. And so here, back in John chapter 4, the proof in the pudding there for the woman at the well that Jesus was the Messiah he claimed to be was that he did know about everything I ever did. She says, he told, he, he told me all that I ever did. So this isn't like just a wow factor thing for her. This is a, a fulfillment of prophecy about the Messiah for her. So she goes off um, into the town and gives them this testimony. And in verse 30, it says of John chapter 4, they went out of the town and were coming to him. So they've left the town and they're on the way. And I've sort of erased our picture here. So I'll, I'll redraw it again. There's, here's the rock on top of the well. And here's Jesus and his disciples are here. And they've come back with food. Here's the town in the distance. The town's getting a little sloppier. And, but we can kind of see there's a crowd coming now, okay? There's a crowd coming now, and they're following her. She's leading them to Jesus. And the disciples at this point, in verse 31, um, they begin talking to Jesus now that she's walked away. In verse 31, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Well, in, in, in the first half of our story of the woman at the well, Jesus uses the picture of water to push the conversation in a spiritual direction. Here, he's going to do the exact same thing, but with food. Now, I know he was hungry. That was the whole reason why they stopped in Sychar. They've been traveling probably for a day and a half already. It's a three-day journey at just about from Jerusalem into Galilee if you take the straight route through Samaria, and he's hungry, they offer him food, and instead of just taking it and eating because he's hungry, 
he says, no, no, I've got another lesson to teach and it's going to be about food. And that's how I'm going to get you guys to start thinking about this. So just like the woman at the well, he says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Just like when he told the woman at well, if you asked me, I would have given you living water. They don't get it. They're thinking temporally. They're thinking about food, literally. So they begin to look around. And it's sort of like they're looking around the well. Maybe there's some leftover candy bar wrappers. Maybe there's some um, you know, Burger King wrappers over here. Somebody's brought him food, and then they've left. And we just missed them. Because they're out in the middle of a field. It's not like they would have you know, missed them. They're a little surprised by this. In verse 33, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? And so then he clarifies and gives them the lesson here. And Dad, you've joined us, so I want to give you an opportunity to read. You're, you're muted, by the way. So um, can you read for us Jesus' response to them in verses 34 through 38? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For they are, for here the saying holds true one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Very good. So what is his food? He says, I have food that you do not know about. What is that food? To do the will of the father. To do and to accomplish to do the will of the Father. Now, he actually said of the one who sent me, but he's sent by the Father. The Father's the sender. Correct. So, I don't want us to skip over this and go, oh, it's just a word picture. We also need to point out the fact that to him, doing the will of the Father is more important than even eating food. He, he, he could have been fed supernaturally. I mean, when he went out into the wilderness for 40 days and fasted, then was tempted by Satan at the very end, when Satan departed from him, angels came and tended to him and cared for him. They could have brought him food even in this instance. He's here by the well. He sent the disciples away, and he's hungry. He could have called on angels to do that. And to him... These are all little things compared to accomplishing the work of salvation that the Father has sent him to do. That's how important it is. So he says, he's, he's not just, he's going he's gonna to sort of rapid fire some word pictures in here for us. The first one is with food. Doing the will of the Father is so sustaining to who I am that it's better than any of the food that you could have brought for me to eat. On top of that, he adds another picture here. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Well, look at that. We've got an agricultural lesson now. Now, I, I don't know if you've ever gardened, but I picked up gardening a couple of years ago. And I have never had a slower hobby in my life. You plant a seed and, and I, I, this is what I usually do. I go out into the garden and let's say here's the ground and I put a seed in the ground, and then I walk in the house, and I say, Tracy, do you think it's sprouted yet? Because I want to go see it. And she goes, husband, it's going to take a while. You're going to have to be patient. It hasn't sprouted yet. And then the next day, I'll come down from work for lunch, and I'll say, hey, do you think that seed sprouted yet? And she'll say, no, I don't think it sprouted yet. And you have to wait so long for it just to even peek out of the soil, and then it's going to dig down and form deeper roots and all of that's happening and you can't see any of it. You know, up here, you just get one little leaf. And then finally it starts to grow and it gets big and beautiful 
and there's still no food on it. It's pretty and you still can't harvest it. It takes so long. Here, the example he gives, don't you say among yourselves, we, when we plant, then in four months, then comes the harvest? In other words, you've got to be patient for these kinds of things. He said, that's not the case today. He says, look, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Now, this is sort of like when th this is an immediate surrounding area picture that I want us to get. He had this conversation with the woman at the well, and when she says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, she's pointing at Mount Gerizim to make her point. Here, Jesus says, look, I tell you, lift up your eyes, turn around and look back to the town you just came from, and do you see that woman in the distance? And she's coming here, now walking towards us with all of her friends. He says, look, the fields are white for harvest. It's like when you've got a field of grain and it's all green as far as the eye can see. It's not ready for harvest yet. And then you see these people coming towards you and it's like the waving, you know, dried heads of grain at the top of the stalks ready for harvest. He says, look, I sowed the seed right now before you even walked up. And while we've been talking, that seed has been growing in the town behind you. And look, it's ready for harvest. That's sort of mind-blowing. That picture there, that immediacy. You know, a lot of times we, we, we can work on our friends. We can talk to them about Jesus. We can ha invite them to Bible study, and they can come willingly and participate and just not get it. It takes a long time, but sometimes you can walk in and plant a seed, and it's quick. God works on different hearts at different speeds. And here he's telling them, guys, pay attention because something big is about to happen and you're about to enter in and be a part of it. So he says in verse 36, he's going to continue that picture. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. Jesus intended for the disciples to be a part of this process, but not for the beginning part. In his sovereignty, he so ordained that they actually would not be present for the initial conversation that he had with the woman at the well. It was just him and that woman. They weren't there to get in the way. They weren't there to overhear or even be a part of it. But they're going to get to come now and be a part of the reaping. When all these people come and they've got questions about Jesus, He's not going to be the only one talking. They're going to be asking the disciples questions about Jesus. Tell us about what you've seen Jesus do. Tell us about what Jesus has taught you. Explain to us, because we don't fully understand, explain to us what we need to know about who Jesus is. And so the disciples didn't get to be a part of the sowing, but they're going to get to be a part of the reaping. And together, they're going to get to rejoice in this process of salvation. I, this is, to me, a really critical distinction that we ought to make, that every single spiritual conversation that you have with a person does not need to be a reaping conversation. In other words, I, I read a book called Tactics. It was Tactics on Sharing Your Christian Faith, and one of the points that he makes in the book is that, you know, you may be the person who is the first person in somebody's life that has ever told them about Jesus. But that doesn't mean you're going to be present for the moment when that person accepts Christ. In fact, there may be multiple people involved in that process. You plant a seed, somebody else comes along and waters, another person comes and prunes, and then finally somebody else comes along and says, dude, you need Christ. You need to make a decision. And they go, absolutely, I want that. Hey, David, I don't, I don't know what you're doing on that side, but we're getting some feedback. Um, and so I, I want to I encourage you with this. Um, a lot of times we make um, presenting your testimony or witnessing a very high-pressure situation, sort of like we're door-to-door -door salesmen. That's not what Jesus was doing. He started off the conversation by saying, hey, can you give me a drink? And then he pushed it over into a spiritual conversation. 
And now the disciples are going to get to walk up, and these people are eager to know about Christ. Disciples don't have to do anything high pressure about it. They literally just want to know. They're going to come ask them about it. And so when you go to talk to somebody, and it may be a friend or a coworker or um, even a family member that's close to you, you may not be the sower or the reaper. You may be somebody who's just the gardener. You come in and do a little gardening in their spiritual life. And the Spirit's going to use that as He will. You may come in and, and share with them what God's been doing in your life. You may ask them about some spiritual things that they've been dealing with. They haven't fully accepted Christ yet, but you're a part of that process. And ultimately, everybody involved in that process gets to rejoice together, the sower and the reaper. So let that be an encouragement to you. Don't shy away from having conversations with people feeling like if I didn't reap a soul today, if I didn't win anybody over to Christ, then I haven't been doing my job. And if you're out there talking about Jesus and nobody responds, you're still doing your job. That's totally okay. So um, we'll finish up that little part here. He says in verse 38, I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. In other words, I sent you away, and, and I may have expected you to have some spiritual conversations while you were in town because of the things that I've been teaching you, and now that you're back, I've done some work, and you're going to get to enter into that work. So we're going to pick back up now. This has all been conversation he's had with the disciples. While he's having that conversation with them, these people from the distance are getting closer, and they end up joining the crowd here. Um, and in verse 39, it says, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told, uh, his, her testimony was, he told me all that I ever did. And to them, that was enough. Wow, if there's really a man like that, wow, I, that he must be the Messiah. I want to come meet him. And so they believed. So in verse 40, when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there for two days. So if we remember from our, our map, it was about a three-day journey from Jerusalem to Samaria. And if you were going to take that, here's the, the mountains in Samaria right here, the Jordan River down this side. And if you start in Jerusalem and you're headed to Galilee uh, up here, this is about a three-day journey to get through this dreaded territory of Samaria. Well, he takes a pit stop in Sychar that turns out to be um, a two-day stay. They ask him to stay, and he stays for two full days, and they're just picking his brain, and he's teaching them, and he's telling them all that they ever did. And at the end of that, in verse 40, uh, let's look at verse 41. David, are you still with us? Can you reread for us verses 41 and 42 of John chapter 4? Because of his word, he was born, he believed. He said to the devil, he no longer believed just because of what he said. Now we have heard for ourselves that we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Very good. So Jesus has stayed. They've continued to learn from his teachings. And the end result there is they don't just believe because she told them. They believe because they've heard the words of God himself. And ultimately, that's going to be the same for us presenting the gospel to people in our lives. They may go, wow, and we tell them about what he's done in and through us, and that testimony is good. But ultimately, it's the word of God that saves souls. We've got to get the word of God in front of people. So the the the, the foot in the door may be, let me tell you about what Jesus has done in my life. But ultimately, we want to go back to that thing, what she said in verse 29, come and see. We've got to get them to come with us and get in the Word so that um, they can hear these words of life, and the Spirit will use that to save them. So be thinking about that. If there's somebody in your life, and there needs to be somebody in your life, pray that God would put somebody in your life for you to be sharing the gospel with, for you to be explaining Jesus to, for you to be inviting them to dwell in the word with you. 
know, they may be shy about coming to church. They may be shy about joining a class like this, but maybe they'd be okay with y'all sitting down on the porch and just reading the Bible a little bit together. And guess what? That's the Word of God. God's going to use that to change souls just like He always has. So what are the two big takeaways from this story? One is this. Um, one is really obvious, and it's the one that you hear preached most often, and that's what we talked about today, and that is to, to look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. In other words, it's out there. There are souls that need saving. We need to get out and be about presenting the gospel to people and teaching them from the Word of God. So um, you know, point one here is that the fields are white for harvest. The second is that the primary reason for Jesus to come and meet this woman, A, it was to save her, but B, it was to make a declaration that he had not made in his own words as of yet in the Gospel of John. And that is that Jesus um, is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the prophesied prophet, priest, and king who would come to bring the words of God to the people like they never had before, to bear the sins as a sacrifice for the people like no sacrifice had ever been made before or since, and to be that spiritual leader, the king over the new kingdom that he was ushering in. Those were the threefold offices of Jesus. And here he is in his own words declaring it. So, um, so that's, that's where we wrap up. That's, we're, gonna, we're just going to put a pin in it. Um, and as I mentioned before I started the recording, I'm going to go ahead and say it again now that we are recording. This is the final chapter of the men's Wednesday night class. Uh, the reasons for that are um, going to the beach next week, so we couldn't do this anyway uh, because no internet. And the other is that Starting next week, First Baptist Church is starting a series of online classes over the next two months on Wednesday nights. They're going to be on parenting, finance, and marriage. So I would encourage um, any, everybody on this call um, to join one of those if they can. I don't want to conflict with that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and stop teaching these lessons. However, I am going to continue teaching these lessons at work. Um, where I've got a small group that meets for a Bible study, and I am going to continue recording those and putting those on YouTube. So if you want to continue following this series of lessons, then you can subscribe to me on YouTube. And if you don't know how to do that, I'll send you, just tell me and I'll send you a link. And, and that way um, you can continue to follow along with these lessons if you want to. But what's that, David? I will send you that link. Absolutely. I think, Dad, you're already subscribed. And if you weren't, um, I think you know where to find me. Yeah, I am. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, I want to thank each of you for coming tonight and for being with us through this uh, long series. I say long series. We've got nowhere close to the end of John. We're still only in John chapter 4 after so many weeks. Um, but I've enjoyed it. John is still one of my favorite books in the Bible. And it's been a pleasure to dwell in a book that is so rich and so simple at the same time um, and be with it, be in it together with you. So thank you for that. Awesome. Thank you for teaching it. Thank you. You're muted, Dad. Thank you for teaching it. We, I am always excited to be in your class. Well, good. I'm thankful for you coming. Um, well, Dad, you came late, so how about you close us in prayer? <laughs> Let's pray. Father, um, you continue to open up our hearts and our minds to things that we didn't know, and I, I think one of the most wonderful things about intimacy with you is that if if we will but think on you 
uh, as you and I exchange today, um, there's so much that you do in directly in prayer. And then there is so much that you do when we're not even in prayer. Um, and it's, it's that abiding, it's that you being with us all the time and not leaving us uh, without the knowledge of your presence. So we're grateful not only for your word, but for the fact that you do what your word was intended for, which shows not only your power, but your gr gracious love and mercy. So I'm grateful for what you've done and for the fact that you've brought these men into and friends into uh, this study together. And we look so forward to the things that you'll be doing um, as you keep us here in this life, uh, making your will and the accomplishment of your work, our food and our drink for the sake of your name, through your, your son, in whom we have salvation, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming, everybody.